Okay. So, um, last two weeks, from last two weeks, last week, we did the mini hackathon, sort of, for learning purposes. So, I don't know, I can't say what about it currently online. Or, the, or even nine participants, let's just see my notes, Teju Madi and some other people. But I feel like we're supposed to have more than this amount of submissions for the competition. So um, I would like to know what happened that for us that we're unable to participate. Any reason? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I don't think they are actually here. So. Oh, okay. Let me, let me just run to the list first. I think. Participants. Yeah. Okay, so, so I would say that everybody that is currently online participated in the hackathon itself. So. Okay. Mm, okay. So I just asked him, please, who is Jean? This Jean person here. So, seems Jean is not around. Okay. So what I would like for us is, there's these three things that I can see here, that's first, second, and third. I would love if we can just like share what we did and how we're able to get such results. Starting with the guy, okay, let us start with Ted. This um, Uluwasayo, I think. Yeah, I think you're here. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Do you mind sharing your screen? Uh, um, I'm actually using my phone. Oh, now. Okay. Maybe if you give me a few, you know few minutes I can just turn on my phone. Okay, no problem. But is anyone here that that can at least start? Is anyone that is somewhat prepared? Because I want us to like share what we did. That's what happened of course. Which any whichever one. Yeah, okay. So um what I did was, you know, just to follow um what we did in that week, like what you put us through during the lecture for that week. So um, I think you sent a file on the Slack group, but later you deleted it or something. So I wasn't really able to work with that file. So- Like a notebook? Yeah, yeah, like a notebook. No, you still do. I didn't delete. It's still on the Slack channel, but you can continue. I, I tried using it actually, but I couldn't find it. So yeah, I just had to. Okay, okay. so um, um, loaded the file, uh, the directory where I have the file. That's okay, then here is just to list all the, the number of files I have in that directory. Okay. Um, we're giving this, you know, um, this JSON file yeah. to be able to the labels that we have for each flower. So, um, like in our training labels now, we have different folders that have you know specific kinds of flowers. So the folder yeah. with um, the folder with the one actually has flowers of pink rose, prime, or, um, prime rose, and all that. So that's just. Okay. What that file gives. That's the information that file gives. And then here, this is just, I use the batch size of 32, like, you know, so, um, to work with 32 images at a time so that you don't uh, mm -hmm. overlook them. Overload the memory. Like, you know, you don't overload the memory by loading all the images at the same time and all that. Okay. Directory for, for the training uh, data sets.
which um, which I just got a nice one on the floor this one. Okay, so um, so here we have um, all the utilities that we need. Um, the okay. data set and the transforms um, transforms function from touch vision and um, numpy and and the rest. The matplotlib for visualization and um, the um, the optim optim module as well for optimizations and all that. So. Okay. Here is um, where we define the transforms. Like, uh, since images usually have different sizes, um, we we want to have like some kind of standard dimensions for the for the images. So that that's why we need these transforms. And um, so these transforms are resize would actually resize all the images to. 256 by 256 pixels. And uh, this color jitter, I can't really recall, um, you know, what, what it does. And uh, maybe it's something to like add some shades of colors or something. I'm, I'm not really sure. Then- um, And amazing colors. Okay. Okay, so this random crop will just like, you know, crop some of the images and, you know, then I, I think the, the, some of the names are self-explanatory. Random horizontal flip will just like invert the images, you know, like some aspects of the images so it's, um, along the horizontal axis. And um, then transforms that tensor converts the image to a, so we touch tensor since we are actually working with tensors, and uh, then transforms that normalize will actually um, like since we are dealing with colored images and we have three channels, so this this array is actually for um, for each of the three channels, which is the red, green, and blue. So the first array is for is for the main. The second array is for sorry, guys. Here is there. The first list is for the main. Second list is for um, standard deviation. You know, just to normalize the, the values we have in each tensor. Okay. So here, this train data is um, where we load our data sets. And um, this train here is the train folder we specified up here, which is flower data slash train. That's where we have our train data set. Then we apply the transforms, which we defined up here. And um, well, this just gives us the, um, the number of images we have uh, sorry, the length of the tensor that we get from uh, what do you call it? From this train data set that we have here. And um, well, this, let me see what's. Okay, I can't really recollect, you know, what some of these things are doing. Cause no, no problem. But it's just about the architecture specifically. Since that after the um, train sample and the train order, you know, we specified uh, the batch size, which is 32 from what I, from what I used in my own training. So, um, 
then we we turn the train loader into um into an nitrator so that we can just you know select um select each, each image one by one you know just to work with one image at a time and um figure size is just in then plot.inf show converts uh, the uh, the array that we get from the image tensors. So you get this image just helps us to display um, the images that we have. Okay, this is where we convert it to to a numpy array. That's the grid image tensor to numpy array. And I really don't think. Um, Okay, so here we are just applying results. So I use the seed of 1023. And um, okay, so this line where we have model is um, since we used um, pre-trained pre model. So I used um, the ResNet 101. And uh, this is just me trying to see, you know, like, the input feature, uh, features and output features from ResNet 101. And um, so initially I set pre-trained to be false just to, you know, see the architecture of the linear, like the linear parts of that pre-trained model or the FC part rather, the fully connected part. So, then here is where you know we got the full like pre-trained model because I said pre-trained to be equal to true, and um, you know I think I was okay. This is just me trying to see the the shape of um, of the samples. Didn't really use it in. Okay, so here is just to check if you know the GPU is available and to make use of it. If um, to set the device to GPU if it is available, then we have the pre train model here. Okay, so this is where. I specified like, you know, how I actually want the fully connected parts of the pre-trained model to look like. So since the input features for the fully connected part of, of pre-trained model uh, is two zero for it. So I started with it here as my FC1. The output of uh, of this layer right here, which has two two thousand forty eight inputs and one thousand and twenty four outputs, is going to be applied to this um, ReLU function. And, uh, um, Hello. Are you still there? Um, I can hear you. Hello? I can hear you. Can hear you. Hello? Hello, I can hear you from here. Oh, okay. So, um, okay, okay. So this is just how I defined the, um, the neural network, the fully connected parts of the neural network. And I don't know, I probably shouldn't have used three layers like this. Maybe if I had used just, you know, two layers, the accuracy would have been better. But, so I used Thank <laughs> you. 
Dr. Marx. Hey there. Okay. Has output function. So to Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. All right, so um, then uh, I tried different learning rates because uh, at first I think I, I had like uh, it's something percent. I used learning rate of 0 0.03. Okay. So I was just like, okay, maybe if I, you know, like uh, try to reduce the learning rate, maybe I'll have something, uh, something more accurate. So I, I used um, 0 0.005 uh, learning rate. Then one thing I did was, um, The airport, the number of airports, which I, <laughs> I need some airport chat. You know, I mean, it, it, it actually took like six months, so, but still, I, I am. Yeah, but what, what speed are you showing now? Okay, okay. I think it's truly now. Yeah. So let me. Okay, so this is the directory where I set where I want my saved model to be stored in. So my the number of epochs I I later used 100, but initially before the last training I used 200 and. The result was not any better than when I used 100. So, and you know why, right? Uh, I I can guess I can guess why, but I, I'm right. not really sure. What do you think was it? Uh, okay, so by increasing the airport, I like. I don't know, it seems uh, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how to put it. I don't really know how to put it. Okay, let me just explain something. Can you go a bit up to where you showed the number of reports? Yes, exactly. So, okay, this you, know, you know that P underscore ITR? Okay. Yeah, so that in itself trains for about 60 reports on its own. Then you, you're then using reports 100, which makes it train that 50 reports 100 times, so more like 50 times 100. You get it. So like it's almost definitely certain that your model overfits. But if you notice, I don't know if you implemented it. If you go down to your code, you implemented saving, um, okay, wow. I think it the validation loss minimum. So, it only saves the model when the validation loss reduces. So in, if at a point, remember when we spoke about model complexity graph? So the graph just shows you the relationship between your training loss and your validation loss. So when your training loss keeps on decreasing, but your validation loss increases, then it does means your model has started overfitting. So for, if you train for such amount of reports, it's almost very certain that your model will overfit. Yeah. Yes. So, well, it depends if you actually um, is it get is a it, model. 
No, if you scroll down, you see what I'm saying. If you scroll down. Um, down, still down. Okay. okay. Um, no, no, not here. But okay, if this was your distance graph, which is validation, well, if you check, you can see that your validation loss is spiking. Your training loss just kept moving down. But validation loss was um, spiking. So it's, it means if you check towards the beginning, when both of them were actually increasing together, were rather decreasing together, that's where your learning rate was probably, um, rather your model was actually getting it correctly. But that moment when it starts increasing, your code, the last part of your code, your training code. Yeah, yeah. The last part of the training code does up. Still on this, the staff cell where you perform training. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, can you hear me, Sayo? Hello? I said, so if you take that part where you saw the validation loss, if the evaluation loss is less than or equals to the minimum loss. So that's really points where the model saves. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to mm. look at that, that part now. Yeah, that's it over there. So that's the if condition. Okay, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So you can continue. Okay, so um This is what I have from the last training. Uh, you know, I think it had about, uh, I think 17 like um, improvements. Okay. Yeah, so. Okay. So you should notice, like at this point, it's, it's almost not changing. So. Yes, yes. So, um, so this is where we graph the training loss against validation loss, and yeah, that part where your mouse is that that's yeah. like the best place is meant to be. That's where yeah. you should probably stop. Mm. Yeah, I guess I get it now. Yep. So, and this is the accuracy graph. Yeah. And um, so this is where I actually save the, this is the file itself and the folder where I save okay. the file. And, yeah, so this line is just loading what I saved from here. 
Okay. So like the saved model is going to be is going to be loaded in this line and here is just to move it to you know the GPU case. The, Okay. Yeah, that's fine already. Yeah, so here is just to to um like test what we've trained on. Yeah. Um another set of data and this yeah, I, I don't think there was much use for this um yeah, I think that you basically explained the main thing, which is the architecture you use. So, yeah. yeah, from the validation loss, you can see it's probably almost the same thought you had on the leaderboard. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay. So, um, these other guys, that's precious, right? Let me confirm. Um, praise and Sharon, do you have anything to present to us? Or? Uh, okay. Okay, I think I should just. Oh, was someone saying something? Uh, Okay, I think I'll just um, go straight to Shane. Like, I, I also participated in it, but that at the end. So I just did it to just implement some things that we already discussed already. So um, I'll just go straight to the architecture that I made use of. So, so I already explained most of this part here, which is just leading your data sets still the same way. So the validation test split was 0.2. So we go straight to the architecture. So I know we already know what early stopping is. So we've discussed about it theoretically, but I implemented it here. So if you can, if you understand from what um, Sire explained, he trained for quite a very large number of epochs, and it's very very likely to overfit during such. So what early stopping does is that when it discovers um, your validation loss is increasing and your training loss is decreasing. So there's what we call patients here. So if you can see, there's this patient um, variable here. So it's, it's like how many iterations it checks. So if, if you iterate for like seven and your, if, if you iterate seven times for like, let's just say seven epochs and your validation loss does not reduce with your, we did from the previous one. So you know, like what I explained before, or was in the code already, there's the minimum validation loss and there's validation loss. So if the minimum validation loss does not get updated, meaning that your model has not improved. So on that seven epoch, it means that it would stop it from training. So that's how it works. So this is just like an implementation by someone. So I can't remember the GitHub page, but let me just show you so you can say, I touch, um, it is stopping. So yeah, so this guy implemented it is just a class. So you can just copy the class from this GitHub repository and test it here. Um, yeah, so this is just the class here. So the parameters it takes in uh, like your patients, your patient is how many epochs will it wait. And if your validation, minim your minimum validation loss does not reduce, it should break from the loop and that will be the end of the training. So it makes it makes you know the best number of iterations or epochs you should use when training. So also it also performs the saving of the best model here. So I just modified it and specified it to the models folder here. So I use ResNet 16. So you could still use many other ones. You could use um, like say use ResNet 101. You could use TensNet. You could use Inception. You could use DGG. So like ResNet models are actually mostly better, even though they are more complex ResNet models. There's SC Res Next, there's SC ResNet. So those are like other more complicated ResNet networks. So for building baseline model, I would advise we use like ResNet 60 or ResNet 34 to at least have a starting point when you are building models. So I use ResNet 34, then 
I, I, you know, this model dot parameters here, if you can check, I can recall that we had it on, um, we added, um, it wasn't commented. So basically, what this does is that it freezes the convolutional layer aspect, which is the feature generation. So what happens is that, even though we're going to do CNN today, but just to explain a bit of how it works, is that when you freeze these layers, you do not want those features to be modified. So the way all these pre-trained models are, I think I explained before, but the way they work is that they are already trained to identify um, low level features. So they are very, very skilled at identifying those things. So what most people just do is that, okay, since these guys are very good at identifying things, I'll just make them my feature extractors or feature identifiers. And then my fully connected layer would just be what I want. So which is this part here. So if you could check Sayos on, like he broke them down from 2048 to something else, then from that one to something else, until you got to the final one, which is 102 classes. So these networks are very, very good at training that. So most people decide to just leave their width. So if you see this from param, um, for parameters in model parameters, param, param dot require grad equals to force, meaning that you do not want to update it while training. You want to use their parameters like that. So you can decide to um, comment them out, which I did. So basically what this means is you're on freezing it. So it means that you want those parameters to change. Why freezing it means you want to use the parameters like that. So another thing I've, I've um, noticed from my experience is that it's straight to your output from this particular input features, which is 2040. There's actually no need like breaking it down. You could do that too. But I've discovered that it performs better when you just go straight to the point from this 2040 to the number of output classes you want, even if it's two. So you could use cross entropy loss or NN um, log loss, that's NN loss, that loss function. So whichever one, all of them works. Then the learning rate schedule, I use this reduce LR, reduce rate on platinum. So these are the variables here. You could check Python's documentation on what they use. So this optimizer is optimizer, this mode, so there's mean and max. So mean now means that you want to reduce your learning rate based on the input. So this time around, your learning schedule is going to take in your value. So that's what it's going to reduce based on. If you put minimum, it means that if you're, if you, okay, let's look at it in documentation here. So this is Python's documentation. So mean now means that your learning rate is reduced when the quantity monitored has stopped decreasing. So in this case, the quantity monitored is our validation loss. So once the validation loss has stopped reducing, it should apply that the whole function will be activated. So, um, okay, so, so yeah, so that's it here, minimum. Then patience now. So for learning schedule, um, scheduler, the patience just means how long you still have checked. If it doesn't reduce, they need to step it down. So patience is similar to what we did in early stopping, early stopping patients. But this one means that learning rate, if the validation loss does not reduce, it will reduce learning rate by this factor here. So this factor now 0 0.3 means that it's multiply your current learning rate by 0 0.3. So that will be your new learning rate. So it just keeps decreasing your learning rate by this factor here. Then this is our early stopping um, initialization here. So for the training, so if you notice the initial way we train now is different from this way. This one, I just wanted to go straight to just a single 50 epoch. So if you see the initial one here, this one I trade for 10 times 50 because a single iteration now, so, um, your epoch is different from this P iteration. So this one means it iterates 50 times for one epoch. So that's how this one works. But I just decided to just use 50 epochs directly. So I'll train for it and that's all. So at the end of it, you then apply your learning rate scheduler. And if you look at it, I passed my validation loss here. So it should drop based on the validation loss. Then this is my early stopping here. You then write, so it's early stopping dot early stop. So this is just what checks it if the patient has been met. So once you discover that your validation loss is no more increasing, it should break out of the loop. So that will be the end of your training. And that epoch will be more like your best epoch, the epoch where it stopped. So this was mine here, my um, model complexity graph here. So you can see it. So then to confirm it, for the validation, my accuracy was 99% um, on validation accuracy. 
So now the thing is that there's what you call um, k-fold cross validation. I'm sure we must have heard about it from normal machine learning, basically. So what it helps us do is that it helps us have a stable validation loss. So this validation loss I had now is 99%, which is quite okay. But for it to, to be very certain of your local validation, that's where it makes use of things like k-fold cross validation. So what it does is that it divides your data sets into a set number of folds, depending on what you specify. If I specify like five folds now, it divides my data set into five. That's my training set into five folds, into five categories. So you can use um, four out of that five for training and use the last one for validation. So something like this now. So if you have our data set, so it is zero, one, two, three, and four. Um, zero, one, two. So if, if this is our, our five folds here, it's from zero to four. So if you add, if you sum all these folds together, you have our full data set. So what we do is that our data set is now broken down into five folds. You can start by training this first three here. You train on this first four and use this fourth one for validation. You get your validation um, accuracy going to this. Then you can then, you then go through again, train again, but this time around, you use the third one as your validation. You get the accuracy. Then next, you do this one. Um, use the second one as your validation. You get the accuracy. Then next, you use the first one as your, accuracy, uh, as your validation. You get the accuracy. Then finally, use this last one as your validation and get the accuracy. So when you then find the average of these accuracies, you've gotten, you most likely have a very stable validation. So that's why it's very, very important. So when I submitted this one, um, this was my score here, which is 0 0.09, on the public fever board here. So this was the score in the public fever board, 0 0.99. So this is the score in the public fever board, but what about the um, private fever board? Because I noticed too that, if you can see, Sayo dropped, his, I think it was about 0 0.95 initially, but when you then combine both, both private and public, you realize that sometimes it can increase, sometimes it can reduce too. So if you check it here, let me go straight to all submissions. So look at it now. This was Femi last own here, so he dropped by just one. And Tash own dropped by two, same with Sayo's own. Then mine too, look at it here. So, yeah, so this was 0 0.991 here. And on the public fund, it was 0 0.97. So it's best to use k fold cross validation. So what you then do is that after using that k fold cross validation, you then have an idea of how your model is, is predicting. And it gives you very, very, like very stable and correct accuracy, both for private and public data board. So once you design such architecture, you can then train on your full set without validation, since you already have an idea of how that model is going to perform. So from there, you can train on everything at once. And you most definitely have, you definitely have a better score than what you had initially. So that was it for that one. Then, uh, is there that thing that I wanted to say? Mm. Okay, no, no, nothing else. So that was it for the competition. So you can, you can, yeah, here, yeah, I remember there was something else that I'd say. So now, this will definitely increase your accuracy. Then another thing now, which is very, very important, both in deep learning and the whole machine learning concept itself, which is assembling of models, which is finding average of models, like it's very, very, very important and very useful. It really increases your accuracy. So now, if you can see, we are training on just a single model. We are training on just a single model, um, which is, for instance, me, I trained on ResNet 15. So for instance, I trained on ResNet 101, and many other people can train on different things. But when you get the submission file for each of these things we've trained on, so if you can see, I saved my submission file as this. So assembly then makes you, what you do is that you don't just throw away the model and pick the best model, because those other ones you've trained that don't really give you the best accuracy had the reason for choosing some of those things. You know, all these things, they are, uh, your model will make choices, basically. 
So there was a reason why he chose that one as his output, which could make sense. And there's another reason why the, your best model chose this output. So if you can assemble their results together and find the average of it, it will give you a more likely answer to all those things. Okay, now if for, um, for categorical variables now, you could use count instead of average. Average is because um, I was using, the one I'm talking about, I was using just probability, so you found the, you find the average. But for something like this, a submission file contains um, classes, which were just categorical variables, like zero or one, if you had more classes, like zero to four. So you can use count this time around. So instead of average, since it's categorical, so if your first model predicted it as one, let's just see a single image. Your first model predicted it as one, your second model predicted it as one, your third one predicted it as zero, your fourth one predicted it as one. So it's most very likely that the score, or rather the actual value would be one, since most models are voting it. So they call it voting classifier, something like that. So it picks the one with the highest um, votes. So that makes you, you almost increase, it increases your model accuracy. So I'll just show one that I did, but this one, the output was the sigmoid function, not the um, class itself. So there was this challenge I participated in. So I'll just show us how I did it. So after I trained, I trained on three networks actually. So this was next 101, SC Resnet 150, 100 epochs, and SC Net 150, 50 epochs. So these three models, when I trained and submitted on with these ones, this one had the higher accuracy. Rather, no, no, not this one. This one here, this SC Net 150, 400 epochs, it had the higher results, then followed by this um, guy, then this guy. But that was just submitting them individually. So what I did was to find the average. If you can look at it, the target here is not single values, but sigmoid function. Sigmoid values actually, between zero and one. So in this case, you can find the average. There's this function, um, there's this function in this sci-fi library here. So which is three mean. So what it does is that it finds the average of those values here. So use my submission one is the first one, which is this guy. Submission two is this, submission three is this. So when you find the average of this thing, you get a score. And that's what I submitted. And definitely my accuracy increased because it's comparing three models together. So assembling is very, very useful too. So that's it. So um, today, I don't know, we've actually taken a lot of time today on many other things. But what was supposed to be is convolutional neural networks. I'll just start by, let's, let's just look at an image. Um, Image of cats. Cats. Let me see. So, uh, um, I like this black one. Uh, okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, if you have something like this now and they want to train a neural network to identify this cat in this image. So based on what we've already learned before the whole transfer learning, we learned how to make use of fully connected layers. So what it does is that you pass in your image. For instance, here, the image we're passing is an image of a cat. So when you pass this image of a cat, what your network does is that it flattens the image. So if you remember when we were dealing with the image data set, the image sizes were 28 by 28. So flattening 28 by 22 gives you 784. So our input node, our input um, size in this case, for, for that particular one was your batch size, for instance, if I'm using batch size of 32, so it will be 32 by 784. So that's what to pass into our neural network. Then that's for the input layer. Then our hidden layer just keeps reducing it. So we can go from 784 to 512 from 512 to 100 and something. So we just keep reducing it until we get to our final classifier, which would probably be two, because we're predicting whether the image is a cat or not. So that's how we do it. But now, if you look at this image, um, this image of this cat here, so I don't know if they show the dimension anywhere. 
um, okay, there's no way I can see the dimension of this particular image. But I thought Google normally show this dimension. Okay. Okay, but since it's not here, let me just leave it. So let's just assume this image of this cat now is um, 100 and, or 1,200 and, or just say 1,200 by 1,200. So that's a quite large image, which is 1,200 by 1,200. So if we just decide to flatten this image, we'll have 1,200 multiplied by 1,200 as our number of pixels, which is this. So our input node will be taking in this value here. So it's very, very large and computationally expensive. So it's very, and what's sad about it is the fact that you will not to get good accuracy even after doing this. So that whole brought about the whole convolutional neural network. So what convolutional neural network does is that it reduces the image from this amount, which is, let's just say, um, we assume this is 1,200 and 1,200. So it takes in that as the image size goes through some set of network which is the convolutional neural network and then reduces the spatial dimension very very largely so it could reduce it from this to even one by one so currently you know this um, colored image is 1200 by 1200 by three because it's colored it can reduce it to one by one so as small as one by one then the feature so the channel this time around but we don't call it channel again would be something larger, depending on how many convolutional layers you applied. So it could be um, 2048. So it could be, let me let me just write it so you can see it. I'm writing it at the top here. So it could be 1000, one by one by one by 2048 at the end. So it should have reduced from 1200 by 1200 by to this. So this would be the new dimension after taking this through the whole convolutional layer. So you almost be certain that the image size is very, very small now because of this. The image size is very small, but the fact is that the, the features, the features that it's identifying, in this case now is identifying images if the image is a cut. So what the convolutional layer does is that it removes those unnecessary parts which are the things in the background and then put the things that makes you know that this is an actual cut. So those are like the important features that it returns. So at that point, you can then flatten it. So if you look at, if you notice them from what you showed in ResNet 50's architecture, the final one, um, okay, let me open it. The final one from the ResNet 50 here, because they apply their convolutional layer. If you can see it here, so the output feature is 2014. So Based on calculations which we talk about, it reduced it from the input size, which was 224 by 224 to 1 by 1 by 1048. So that's what the conversion layer helped us do. It helped us reduce that image and also get those important features. So CNN is basically a feature extractor or dimensionality reduction um, function. So there's this. Um, so there are just a list of sites I'll send so you can just, for better understanding, I'm basically going to explain how all of them work. So when I was learning it, I used this guy's blog post and it was really, really helpful. So I'll just explain it based on it. So if you have an image like this now, an image of this dog here, we know that computer sees these images as pixels. So pixels like this here. So that's what we take. So if you want to identify something like these dogs now, we use convolutional neural networks to extract the features and then use um, the normal fully connected layer of layer perception to do the main um, identification of the dog itself based on those features that we generated. So the first and most important part of convolutional neural network is the filters. So you could call it filter or kennel size. So can we see the text on this um, page very well? Can we see it very well? Okay, let me, okay, I didn't get one sentence, but let me just try and increase it, okay. Okay, okay, pretty sure you can see it. 
So the first and most important part of the whole CNN is the filters. So what filters yes, are, are the, Okay, okay, thanks. So what filters, what it does is that it helps us identify those features. So remember what you said that we want to get just important features from those images, which is what we want to predict. So what the filter does is that the filter eliminates unnecessary parts of that image and returns the necessary part. So you can think of it as a sliding window here. So if you look at it now, if you, if you have an image like this here, this, this side here as the image, so the filter is like a touch light, according to this guy here, which makes sense. So you'll be sliding through the image from here. So let me go straight to this place here. You can see it here. If you can see what's happening at this side, this is your filter. The filter has a particular dimension, but what it's doing is that it's going through the image and taking steps and sliding through every part of your image. So that's how filters work. So while it's sliding here, the question is, what is it doing specifically? So, let me go to this guy's side here. So the filter itself, first of all, the filter is an N by N by, um, okay, if, if you have one image of this size now, let's just say 20 by 20 by one now, you know that this means is an image that is just 20 by 20 and it has only one third dimension, so which is the color channel. So if it was 20 by 20 by three, it means it has three depth channels to so three channels. So if I was to apply a filter on this dimension here, I have to use a, an n by n by the exact number of dimensions that I have here. So in this case, n by n by one. So you can decide to use a filter of size five by five. You can decide to use filter of size two by two. But I think the most popular one is three by three filters. I think that's, I'm not really sure, but that's the most, around the most popular ones you can you see mostly. So the filter slides through your image from the top like this to the bottom, it keeps sliding using the dimension you specified. So here, it's, it's going to slide through this 20 by 20 by one. So now, if we had an image that was test by three, it means we use a filter of n by n by three two. So the output of that thing now is what they call this acquisition map here. So that output itself will now be the, the new dimension I'll talk about the new dimension you get first. On. So you get the new dimension, which is, let's just say N by N, then the third dimension, we don't call this channel again this time around, we call it depth. So that depth is now the number of times you apply that filter. So in this case, the number of times I'm applying the filter is one, so we have N by N by one. So let me just go over it again. So if you have it, it's two by 32 by three, okay, I think I should, how can I write this? Um, let me let me use one of these notebooks. Okay, I'll just use the end of the notebook. So, if we have an input image now, which is text two by text two by um, three, let me use three now. So, this is our input image now. Then we decide to go through the image. That is the first convolutional part, which is the application of your filter. So. The filter would be five by five by three. It definitely has to be five by five by three because it must meet the number of channels here. So when you apply this thing, the output itself would then be n, okay, let me stop like that, n by n by one. That's because we applied one filter to this image. So if you apply three filters to this image, the dimension will be n by n by three. If you apply seven filters to this image, it will be n by n by seven. So based on the number of times you pass this filter inside this image that you get the output. So the whole point of this filter is to get those important features. So what it does is that it gets important parts and it is unnecessary ones. So that's how filters work. So I'll come to, I'll, I'll still explain the calculation on how, on what this n value will be. We'll come about this, but let me just go through one notebook that explains filters itself. So um, let me just, this, uh, when with seven, okay. Uh, yeah, and then filters. Okay, so filters basically, what they help us do is that they help us, like I've said, get important things. So based on what you want. So 
there are different types of filters. There are edge detection filters too, and they are very popular ones. So if you have an image like this now, here, we can convert the image to grayscale, which they did here. So they converted the image to grayscale here. So now you can create your own filters. There's what they call um, Sobel filter. So Sobel filter is a type of edge detection filters. So once about edge detection filters, of which I'm not really sure why they did something, is that if you sum up all the values in the array, you get zero. So if you try doing it here, one plus minus one is zero, two plus minus two is zero, one plus minus one is zero. So that's also about edge filters. I can't really explain the reason why they always um, sum up to zero, but I know it's something related to the fact that for edges, when you want to identify edges, there are places where the intensity of the pixel changes like um, instantly. So here, to show that this is an edge now, if you look at this image, to show that this is an edge, it changes from white to black, um, so from white to this gray color here, instantly. Or like this other part, on this part here, you can see that there are just slight changes. But where there's an immediate change, it's almost certain that that's an edge. So that's the reason why those values sum up to zero. But I'm not really certain how it works. So there are different types of edge detection filters. There's this very popular one, which is Sobel filters. So Sobel filters is for detecting edges too. So these are just two types of Sobel filters. Then, if you can see here, this image, we loaded the image and called it um, gray here. This is the image gray. Then now, to then apply that filter to the image, you use this OpenCV function, which is cv.filter to the. So what it does is that it takes in the, um, the image itself and then applies the particular filter you want here. Yeah. So for this X and Y, the main difference is just the fact that it's the transpose of the other, one is the transpose of the other. So when you apply to the filters, you can see now, you can see the image. So it has detected those edges here. You can see those edges. So those are the places where the image changes. So there are different types. You could modify it even, but the point is that it must always do exactly what we said. So you could use, um, let me just say 10 and 10 here. But the point is that it should sum up to zero, basically. So you can see it. So this is how filters work. So there are different types of filters. But the popular one is Sobel filters. So that's just um, like a test on how to use filters. Do you have any question up to now? Okay. I think I'll just continue. So, sorry, let me see that much. Much is getting low. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so well, we now we understand how filters work generally. Um, so, okay, so we understand how filters work. So the point now is that the filters make us understand and get important features. And to mathematics right now, to then show how filters work, let's use this example over here. Yeah, something like this now. So this is a filter. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a seven by seven filter. So this filter, what it does is that it identifies curves, like this is a curve. So that's what this filter does, it identifies this curve. So this is how it looks like in matrix form. Basically, this is not, um, well, this is the mathematical aspect of it. So the image, the computer sees this three by, sorry. Uh, the computer sees this um, seven by seven matrix. And these are the values that represent this curve here. So you can see it's 30, 30, 30, 30 up to here. So when you pass this filter into an image, it means you want to detect something like this. So whenever it sees something like this in an image, the weight values would increase. So I'll show you an example here. So if you wanted to use this particular filter to identify that curve in this image, so if you have an image of this now, remember our filter, we're going to be sliding this through and checking. So let's just assume we get to this part where it discovered it. So we know, we know from here, visually, we can see that this is where what we're looking for, and this is an area that contains what we're looking for. So let's just assume, let's just say we are fast forwarding, and we're at that point where we've actually met what we're looking for. So this is how it works now. So this is the filter here, and this is the particular image. This is the part of the image that the filter is looking at. 
So what you what the whole conditional learning network does is that it multiplies the two of them together element wise. So this zero multiplies this zero. So you obviously get zero. But you can see that um, from here like this and like here like this, we are certainly going to get zero because there are zero values. Then now here in the image, here was 15 and here was 15. In our future, because we're looking for something like this, this 15 multiply this one, you get zero. This 15 multiply this one, you get zero. All these 50s here multiply this one, you get zero. So only the ones that make up what we're looking for would actually give you a value. So when you get a high value, just like our maximum likelihood, so when, when you um, multiply it, you sum up all of them. So getting a large value means that it, it detected that feature in that place. So now, what, if you notice, what has happened is that it should sum them up and you have 666, six, 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 zero, zero. you have this as your new value here. So look at it here. Okay, no, this is how, the, um, this is how it works. So look at, if you look at this now, this is our input. This is after we've applied our, um, our filter convolution. So it took this five, if you look at it, one, two, three, four, five, and it changed everything from five to just a single one. So everything that this five thing here, this five pixel dimension, five by five pixel dimension is presenting, it um, shrinks it down to just a single one. And this single one contains the important features in this place. So if our filter didn't detect anything here, it's most likely that it would be a zero here. So we've gotten that, we've removed unnecessary parts here. But this is just for one. We'll still apply filters again and keep reducing, keep, keep reducing until we get just only important features that we need. So that's how it just keeps reducing. So here, we've used this to identify that it is present here and that's why I have a high value. If you test it in somewhere like here, if you test it somewhere like here, the values here will be zero, and when you add this one, when you multiply it by this, it didn't detect anything like that, so it returned a zero. It means it didn't detect it. Okay, now let's look at this one here. If you can see, this is, is looking at this part here. So we can just assume that it's representing this. This is our pixel representation here. All these values are pixel representation. And we want the filter, this particular, by identifying this from our filter. So when you multiply it, all them together and sum them, you can see that. Everything our filter is looking for, this guy does not have it to give. So that's why we have zero. So if, if this was it here, if this was our filter applying it here and we have zero, it means that it will send a zero here. So no feature detected. That's what is more like the same. That kind of thing. So when you keep applying these filters to this convolution, we then get important features and eliminate unnecessary ones. So that's the essence of the submission. So we've reduced it from, um, let me, let me show you, we read it from this dimension to this dimension. So, um, okay, I think let me just show you a bit of what the, this output does. Um, okay, we look at custom filters. So now, the convolutional layer visualization. So, this is here. So this is what happens after we apply our filters to images. So that's what this notebook helps us with. So I'm just going to, run it here so if you have an image like this now this is an image of a car so first of all we have to note that they converted it to grayscale so it means that our dimension is whatever the dimension of this image is by one because it's just a single um, grayscale image so now i'm going to define my visualization my filters rather but note that pytorch automatically gives helps us with those filters so you're not trying to specify a few things out there, but you can decide to specify a few things. So now this is me specifying a four by four filter here. So this is a four by four filter with this shape. Then this is now defining four four by four filters. So if you can recall what I was, what I was explaining here is that if you apply um, just a single of this filter here, you have n by n by one. If you apply four, you have n by n by four because we applied four filters. So the whole purpose of this one is that we're going to apply these four different filters to a single image. So that the new image dimension will be whatever we want by four. So these are four filters. 
Then just the representation of how the filters look like. So these are uh, this is actually an edge detection filter too. So it's for detecting edges. If you know, like based on what I've, expa I've explained, if you sum everything here, you have zeros. So this is just their values. So now we're going to define our conditional layer. So this is just the normal way PyTorch works. We all know the class method. So now I'm going to pass in my filters, which is this. This is my filter value, which is this weight here. I'm going to pass it into our network where I'm going to initialize. Then, okay, I think I start from here. So now in Python, I don't know if you know this dot on squeeze does. So what on squeeze does is that it um, specifies how it wants to release values in that dimension. So on squeeze zero means, okay, let me, let me just comment this one out. Okay, before I comment that, so this is what our weights look like. But our weights, um, what do you call it? Uh, let me remove this on squeeze first. Okay, so what did it say? Okay. Yeah, look at this. This is an error you get, but that's the whole essence of that on squeezing. So this is our normal width here. These are normal width values here. These are normal width shape. So when you apply this on squeeze now, if I put on squeeze zero, so what this does now, if you look at it here, is that it adds one to the first dimension, to the first um, shape, first part of the shape. So this is more like saying one is saying, if I print the width, this is like saying um, one, four, so this is like the first part here. This first bracket here, that's the one. So it's like containing this, it means it's a, an array, it's all of them are wrapped in just a single array. Then four, which is this one here. Four, one, two, three, and four, which is this. Then four by four again, so which is this four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. I just got what I'm saying. But basically, let me just explain what this on squeeze does. What does this on squeeze does is that putting on squeeze to one means that if you iterate through this thing now, you'll be getting for each iteration now, this is just the like more like our batch size. So it means we want to iterate four times. If I if I look through this thing once, it means I want to go through four times and get the four by four filters that I have specified. So this means it is four, um, this means it is four, four by four filters. If I put it as zero, let me try and it again. Okay, so this means it is just one, four, four by four. But I want to release four, four by four filters because the filters has to be four like this. It has to be specified like this. So I'm going to apply these four filters four times. That's the whole point of it. So, just to explain it again, so this is our height and width for the filter here, which is four by four. Then with PyTorch to apply convolutional neural network, so that's the we specify this any end of to the. So what it takes is our input channel, which is one. Remember the image is grayscale. Then our output. So this are, this is our distance, our output channel. It is four because we are making use of four filters. Like I've mentioned, it's four because I'm making the four filters. So it is we're going to increase from one to four. If you look at what I explained here, so the new dimension of this, when we apply this, to, when we apply this filter to this image four times, is the height and width by four. So that's what it does. So the new channel, or for this case, we call it depth, would be four. Then this then means that we want to use our own filters, not PyTorch filter. So if I leave this thing like that. It makes use of Python's default filter. So it doesn't make use of my own filter here. So this, this let me see if um, the case of visualizer is here. So this is the output of Python's default visualizer, but I'll still come back to this. So in this case, I'm using my own um, filters here. So by doing that, you just put um, self.com.wait will not be equals to touch.nn.parameter. So this just means I'm passing my own my own custom filter to the image. So then our failed method is just applying each of these functions we defined. So you pass our image into this com side, then we'll get our acquisition function. In this case, I'm using ReLU. So like I've mentioned, ReLU 
that's um, for every value less than zero, ReLU is zero, the output of ReLU is zero, but values greater than zero, the value is the actual value that it's meant to be. So in this case, I'm going to see what the image will look like after our convolutional layer and after our activation function here. So we'll just go through that soon. Okay. So this um, this um, function is going to make us print out those, those layers that we mentioned. For the four filters, because we are, we are looping through each of those four filters I mentioned. So this is it here. So we have our image, which is this here, to get our image, our basic image, and convert it to a tensor, first of all. And after converting our image to a tensor, we'll pass it into our model. We'll pass our image into the model that we've defined. Then we we'll get our convolutional layer and our activation, and our activation layer. So that's this here. So the convolutional layer is what the output when we pass it through our convolutional layer and the aggregated part is when we pass it through our learning function. So if you realize that now, you see it here. So this is what our filter does here. This is the output of our filter. But like I've said, if you check the other one now, that's when we don't use our own custom one. By commenting it out, it makes use of Python's default filter. So this, this is what it looks like. So I'll just stick to our own here. So now, like this, the ReLU pass now. So like I've said, ReLU assigns gives zero to pixel values less than zero, and um, gives an, and gives x for any value greater than zero. So it just turns all negative values to zero, which is black. So this just basically it. So anything that is less than any pixel value that is less than zero, it gives its value of zero, which is black. So now this is just how the filter works. Then um, okay, that's what I was explaining. So now to then ex understand the calculation part of this thing here, this is the of, of how the values reduce. So let's come to this part now. So for the convolutional layer now, it accepts the value of W1 by H1 by D1. So what this basically means is that this is our width. This is our width, our image width, our image height, and the depth. For the input part, you can basically just call this depth the channel. So if I'm if I take for instance set by set two by set two by set two by um three, if that's our input image now, and we pass it through a convolutional layer, which is um this when we apply this, which is a convolutional layer to it. I'm going to use this this same five by five filter that this guy used. So we see that we get exactly the same thing here that he got. So now, when we have this, I don't know if I should use a notepad. Um, I don't know how good I am with this thing, thing, but let's just try. So you have something like this now. So if I have, we, the first value you have is, um, these are widths. So how it works now is that this is the formula here. The width, the new width that we get after passing to the foundational layer is your actual width, which is, 32, if you have 32 here, then minus our filter size. So if you check this guy's side, he used a five by five filter, but always note that the filter must be the same dimension of the image, so it is five by five by three. So minus the filter kernel size, which is F, um, in this case is five, then plus two times our padding. So now, this padding of it is now, to explain more about this padding, what padding does now is that, let me look for a way to explain it. Yeah, so I think he did. Uh, I hope he did in this particular book. Okay, no, no, I don't think he did in this one. Book. In this, sorry, um, yeah. Yeah, so this is how padding looks like. So if you have your test by test image now, Padding means how many of these extra layers are you adding. So padding of zero means how many of how many things are you adding. It's more like making it a frame. So padding means that you want to increase the dimension from just test two by test two by three to an extra dimension. So if I put padding of two, 
PadNoc 2 increases it by two, two layers. So it then be adding, adding a zero layer and then another zero layer, um, layer on top. So the new dimension will be 36 by 36 by three. So padding just increases it by adding zeros to it. So there's a reason why we use padding, but I'll come back to explain what it means. So first of all, let's just assume we're not making use of any padding. So in this case, based on this formula here, our padding is zero. So if our padding is zero, two times zero is zero. So we have um, just our, um, this by our width, which is 32 minus five plus zero, because our padding is zero. Then all of our stride. So now to explain what that stride is now. So if you notice from this um, image here, I'm gonna take this down here. Yeah. So if you notice how this thing is moving, so it moved from this to this. I don't know if you can see it very well, but the way it's moving, let me, is there any way I can, I mean, I, sorry, let me try and see. Let's see, and then stride. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, this explains it very well. So if you notice now, these are our inputs now. Remember that if you apply, if you take this red side, for instance, which is from here to here like this, let me make this larger. So if you take this like this, if you take this particular, um, if you take this as our first film filter, if you notice what, from what we've explained about the filter is that it compares it to the filter and then sums it up and returns the output. So the output from this red side would be this here. The output of this green side would be this. But how does the spatial dimension change, which is now what I want to explain. So this stride now is how many steps it took before it, um, the, you know, it's more like that um, touch that is sliding through. So now this stride is what tells you how many steps it takes during that sliding process. So if you can see this one now, the change from this red to green is just a single step. So it changed from here to here, which is just a single step. So if it changed from this place to this place here, it means that it took two steps, which is a stride of two. If it changed from here to here, it means it took three steps. So one thing that we need to know is that we must always make sure that our stride makes sure that we go through at each part and and it does not overflow. What I mean by overflow is that if I use a stride of two now, let's just say it's going two steps, which is from here to here. The next step will be from here to here. Next step will be from here to here. So now once we get to this part here, we cannot apply our distance. We cannot apply our filter to this part, to this left dimension again, because it's just one and our filter size is three by three and there's no space for it to complete. So that's why in most cases, people prefer to use foot and stride of one, even though stride of one is not really fast because it's just taking a single step. It's very, very certain that it won't overflow. So if you look at it from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and when you get to this part, it stops because it has got to the end. So you must be certain that it, is, it, it doesn't, like it is enough for it to occupy the whole, um, width, same as the height too. So look at it, so if you use two, let me show you again. So from here to here is the second one. From here to here is the, okay, so two, two actually work, if you check it. So it's moving from here to this place for the first part. Then our dimension will cover here. Then if it takes two steps again, it's come to this part and then cover here, so it makes sense. But if you try three steps now, which be from here to here, then this one will occupy here like this. It's obvious it won't work. Then from here, three steps again, one, two, three, it will come here. And if three steps don't work, two steps work for this particular one, but three steps won't work. Everything. But the thing now is that, if you notice from what I've explained now, because it's a single step, that's how we have five by five as our output. But if you take two steps, let's look at two steps. Two steps reduce it to, this is um, the first one will be, here, which is one, then two steps will be here, which is the second part, and the third step will be here, which is the third part. So if you if you take it by three steps, your near your next 
output dimension just be three instead of five like this. Five is five because we're taking just a single step. So if you count is this is one, then two, then three, then four, then five. This is the fifth one. So it stops there. But if you use two steps, so this is the first one, then second will be here. Then the third one will be here. So you just have three. Wait, please, is anyone lost? Because it seems I've been talking too much and I don't even know what the situation is. Hello. Yeah. We are following. I'm following. <laughs> okay. Please, like, I also want to be certain, like, that we understand what, what okay, okay. I also want to be certain that we understand what's happening. But this, this is just how it's going to work. So if you look at this now, like, I want, I want us to tell us, about, so if you can post it on the message channel, that's the chat, rather. So I want to see it here. So how many um, steps do you think, what strides do you think this particular filter is making use of? Two. Two steps. Mm, yeah. Exactly. So it's just it's taking two steps. Yeah. It's taking two steps. So now to then do the calculation, back to the calculation part that I was showing. Um let's just go back to where I stopped. I can't remember where I stopped. We're talking about yeah, it was the calculation, yes. Mm. So now like I've said, our um why isn't zero pardon? We're not making use of pardon, so our pardon is zero in this case. So I just need to leave that one at zero since it's two multiplied by by the value which is zero. So now our stride now, if I use a stride of one, here yeah, this one is too long. If I use a stride of one, here, yeah, mm -hmm. then plus one. Let me let me go back to the equation. So it says to look at it here. So our actual width, our initial width minus our filter size, so five, padding of zero, that's zero, then a stride of one, one. Let me just confirm that the guy is the stride of one. Um, yeah, so he mentioned this, next step is moving the filter to the right by one unit, so it's a stride of one. So plus one, so if you calculate this thing now, this is, there's two minus five, you have 27. So 27 divided by one is 27 plus one, you have 28. Uh, my eight is funny. So you can see it now. So that's why he got 28 by 28 by one. Do we get? So now let me come back to these guys in here. Let's look at this one. So in this case, he has an infinite dimension of seven by seven. So if you have seven as our actual infinite size, then next thing I mentioned, if you check the formula, is minus the filter size plus Two multiplied by the padding all over your stride plus one. So let's do it now. Yes, what's in the formula again? Minus filter plus your padding. Yeah. So minus our filter. So if you can check our filter, our filter is three by three from what you can see here. Minus three. Our padding is zero plus zero. Then divided by our stride. In this case, he's using just a single stride. If I use a single stride, which is one, then plus one here. So this is four all over one plus one. So we have five as our new output size. Then if I use a stride of two, like I've mentioned, so you have this minus this, which is um, four divided by two, which is two plus one. So you have three. Based on the visual representative that we explained. Then if you then try three now, so you definitely see that you have a decimal value and it means it cannot work. So this is, Four divided by three plus one, so it's not work because you're going to have you are not going to have a whole number. So that's how you perform your convolutional layer. So based on what you've seen now, so um, we've we've seen that that's how it reduces in dimension. But if you can see, like I've mentioned, because it's just a single filter, we have the new dimension by one because we applied just a single filter. In that example here, you can see we had four filters here. And we apply these four filters. That's why the new dimension changed from one to four. That's it. So 
Now, we're done with this part now. So, okay, let, let me just go through it. We've explained how this one works, how the conventional layer works and all. So, so um, okay, I'm not going to close this, but I'm going to share it on the group chat. So now we've explained how the, um, how the convolutional layer works, how it reduces based on the filter that we've passed in. So you realize now that what that filter helps us do is that it gives high weight values for places where it detected the feature it's looking for. So places where it didn't detect it, you see very, very low weight. So you can have just the, um, a large input size like this. Um, sorry. You can have a very large input size like this. Okay. But our conventionally has reduced it by to this force. So now, since we're done with this now, I explain now let me explain what this padding does now. So remember what we said now. We said that if you have this image like this, this seven by seven, and when we apply our conventional layer, we'll have a reduced dimension, which is five by five. So now what if we, we want to what if you want to increase the depth? Definitely, the depth is very important. So if you apply four filters to this thing, if you apply four filters to this thing, uh, normally the depth increases to four, but also the dimension reduce again. So imagine this is just when you apply a single filter. If you apply a single filter, it reduces from seven by seven to five by five, and the new depth will be one, the depth of our output will be five by five by one. So now what will happen now is if, if we apply four filters, it will keep reducing this dimension continuously. Just applying a single filter reduce this to five by five. If you apply four filters, it reduces it, it keep reducing it, keep reducing it. But our new um, channel or depth would be the number of times we apply the filter. But what if we don't want to reduce this thing from seven by seven to five by five? Want to keep the exact dimension, but reach, but increase the the depth. Remember, the depth is the in quotes number of channels. So if you apply, let's just say, want to increase it from um, the input depth. Let's just say this image is a colored image and it is three. Oh no, let's just say it is it's not a colored image. Let's just say it's a grayscale image, which is like one each depth or channel of one. I want to apply the filter four times to get a channel of four. But we don't want to reduce the image because now we've seen that whenever you apply the filter, the dimension reduces. So what will happen? What will you do in order to make sure that even after we pass it through our conventional layer, does not reduce, but instead gives us exactly the same shape, which is seven by seven. So that's where that padding helps us with. So based on this guy's notebook now, you can see that they applied the padding of two. So that padding of two now is the reason why they use. Used to, but let us just try to explain. So, I mean, can you hear me? Okay. So can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Now. okay, okay. So, now let us try it now. Now that they've added the padding of two here. So, if our image size was 32, look at it here, 32, and um, our filter, like we know, our filter is still five by five, okay? Then plus our padding, now we are saying we're adding a padding of two, if you can see it here, these are the two new dimensions of padding we've added. So you have two bracket two, then divided by our stride. If you if you like, if you do the whole um
Um, how is it? Is it better now? Hello, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so back to what I was saying. So you perform this operation on this step two minus five, which is 27. So 27 plus four will give you 31 plus one, you have 32. So now this, because we've applied the padding of two, we have exactly the same dimension that we had, which is 32 by 32. So now with this, with this particular um, setting now, using a padding of two give us exactly the same dimension we had here. So with, with this particular setting now, we can perform the operation multiple times to increase our distance. Okay, that's better. So now the point now is that if we apply these filters multiple times using this particular padding, we'll have exactly 32 by 32 at the end. So even if you apply like seven filters, we'll still have exactly the same dimension. So that's the essence of padding. So padding helps us retain it. So now the formula for this padding thing, to know exactly how many padding to use in order to get exactly the same shape. I'll show you the formula now. But you can see, Two didn't just come up by magic, but two works because of this particular setting that we're using. So the formula for the padding is, I don't know if anyone wrote it for, let me see, yeah, so this is here. So you used to set, for you to set the padding, it's just your kernel minus one divided by two. That's the size of your filter. So if you can see it here, um, let us just see it here. So in this case, our filter size is five, five minus one all over two. So this will just tell you how many, how much padding to add to get exactly the same dimension you had initially. So five minus one plus or divided by two give you two. So it means we we'll use padding of two. Once you use a padding of two, we'll have exactly the same thing. If you use a padding of one, we'll have a slightly lower, lower one than 32. But using a padding of this with this formula would make us know what it is. So that's the essence of padding. So padding just make sure that we do not um, reduce the size. But in most cases, I think um, both in most pre networks, and personally, me myself, I prefer to use padding to make sure that the convolutional layer does not reduce the actual dimension. Instead, it just helps us increase the number of, um, the depth rather. It, it, we just use it to increase the depth because the more the depth, the more features um, that gets generated. So that's just what we use it for. So what do we then now use to reduce the size? Because obviously, the essence of convolutional neural network is also is to get the important features. Those important features are gotten by increasing this depth and also reduce the spatial dimension. So we we'll always then talk about pooling layer. So it's the pooling layer that reduces that reduces the dimension itself. So um, I think I don't know if you explained. Let me see. Yeah. So now this is how the pooling layer works. I think in this particular cs two to one end, they spoke about pooling layer. Let me look if they had the visual representation of it. So, um, okay, unfortunately I can't see. But okay, now just look at it from here. So now this is how the pooling layer works. So the pooling layer has its own filter too. So, but its filter is different from that of the filter for generating features. The pooling layer, what it just helps us do is to, um, to reduce the dimension specifically. So if you use this method now, let's use this, this um, visual representation here. So if our pulling layers filter looks at this, it's not going to features this time around. What it's going to do is to reduce the dimension specifically, like that is job, just reduce the dimension. So there are two types, there's average pulling and there's max pulling. So for max pulling now, max pulling is very, very popular. I think in most cases we prefer to use max pulling. So if, if from here you can see that it's very certain that the pulling filter size is Two, two by two. So two by two and so you get those two things you need to specify one way you want to use pulling layer. The first one is your filter size and the second one is your stride. So the stride is still the same type of stride that I was talking about when we were talking about the convolutional layer. So the, the first of all we'll talk about the um the features the filter size or kernel size. So using a kernel of two means that it takes two by two pixels at a time. So take, for instance, this particular is an image. This is an image of four by four. So if you apply the, a pulling layer to it, using a um, filter of two, take this first four side here. 
So when you look at it now, in this case, they are making use of max pooling. So it takes the maximum value amongst all of them. So in this case, the maximum value is six. So it returns six here. Then from here, you can see it takes, and so now from here, you can notice that the change of the number of steps is taking is two. So it's a stride of two. So using a stride of two now, the next part is this. So you find the max, the max is eight, you put eight here. Here, the max is three, you put three. Here, the max is four, so you put four. So now you reduce the dimension from this to this. So this pulling layer does not give you features at all. So it's going to remain the, the feature dimension, which is your depth, is going to remain the same, but your size will reduce. Like that's just all it does. So you reduce the size from four by four to two by two. But if the number of, um, if the depth here was 10, the depth will still be 10 here. So, to just show the formula or how it works, um, this is the pulling layer formula here. Did he explain a, a hand? Yeah, so it's still the same thing here. This is the same thing, the same example they used here. So it is using a filter size of two by two and a stride of two. So this is how it works here. So if our image size was, let me just go back. If our image size was 32, yeah, in this case, let's just assume that we applied our filter and we had it at two by 32 by let's just say by three no 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 let me not say three let me say by four so for the one we're going to use that one at all so these are our input size our input width the reason i'm not doing height is because it's basically the same thing like the same operation the only thing you are changing is your width and height but it's basically the same operation for both this and the convolutional part so our image size is 32 by 32 so we, our width is 32 then our filter like we said, maximum just needs filters and stride. Our filter is, um, which, okay, they use a filter size of, let me see what this guy is, so I will know. Um, okay, no, no, let me just use the filter of two. So if I use the filter of two, so it will take two multiplied minus two. In most cases, most um, pre layer filters are two. Sometimes it can be three, depending on what you want. Depending on the mathematics too. So, this takes two minus two divided by our stride. Our stride is two plus one. So when you do this, you have 32 divided by two, 16 plus one. So you have 16 by 16 as our new dimension. So it will be 16 by 16 by your actual initial depth. So the depth does not change. If you can look at it, if you look at it here, the depth is equal to the depth. D1, D2 is equal to D1. So the D does not change, your depth doesn't change. But if you look for at that of the convolutional layer, number of filters, that's your new depth. So the number of times you apply that filters, that would be your new depth. So that's how the pulling layer works. So then to visualize the pulling layer side here, so this is the code for visualizing the pulling layer. So what's time now? Oh, 244, so we're done. So, so this is how it works. So you can, if you check it now, this is our input image here. We're passing our input image. Then the convolutional layer, the depth of the convolutional layer is how many times you apply the filter. So you apply our convolutional layer. Then we apply our pulling layer. Our pulling layer reduces the dimension. Then for our pulling layer, you can decide to take it to our frequency layer. But if you check most of all these complex networks like ResNet and the rest, they always have very, very large deep convolutional layers because they, they generate quite a lot of features. That's why they are very important and useful. In fact, that's why in most cases, you prefer to use between networks than using their network from start. From scratch. So if you take this one now, from here you can see that the image is basically so it is whatever the size is by one. So in this case, we're still going to use our, our own filter here. We've spoken about all these parts. So here, this is now like the convolutional layer, rather the pulling layer side. So using a stride of two and using a filter of two by two, it picks the largest. So it's obvious that this max pool. Average pool just sums everything up and divided by the total size which is four in this case. So you sum everything and divide it by four. So that gives you our average pool. But in most cases, we would prefer to use um, max pool because it's max rate actually. So here we should do the same thing that we're doing. But this time I want to get and print the output of our convolutional layer, our activation layer and our pulley layer. So when we pass it, this is how we define our convolutional layer and initialize it our own custom width. So here, this is the max pool function. So what the max pool function takes are the two things that I specified. So Python already like takes those two things. So this first two value here you can see is the size of your filter. And the second one is 
decide your number of stride. So for the conventional layer two, this first one is your input um, dimension. So you, rather your input depth or channel, which is one because it's great scale. Then this is our output depth, which is four. It's four because we're applying four filters. Then our kernel size is um, what we want. In this case, it is, I don't know what kernel size they use. Okay, they use exactly the shape of the filter because that's what that is, which is four by four. Then the other things that you could add, which are the pulling, the deal, just say pulling, the padding and the stride. But by default, padding is zero and your stride is one, I think. I think by default, your stride is one. So you don't need to specify since we're using default ones here. So after passing through our conventional layer, we pass through our activated layer and we pass through our pulling layer. So um, our class return the output of each of these layers because that's what we want to visualize. Then when we start visualizing that of each of the layers, so here is the one for the, let me see it, for the activation layer. This is also from the activation layer here. So it still is the same size for the activation layer. Then for this part now, this is now the output of the pooling layer. So it's still the same features, but we have reduced the dimension. So this is just like a print of each of their shapes. So if you can see here, the conventional layer shape is 210 by 317. But that of the print layer is 105 by 158. So I don't know which, where we should try um, calculating to ourselves. Let's just try it. Okay. So, okay, I want to use my calculator. So to put it in that form that we all know here, let me just go back. So our input size was, if you can see it here, these are, um, okay, they didn't use a padding. Okay, let's look at it again. I want to see the size of that image. Grayscale image, no. That's shit. Okay, so this is our image shape here. So it is 213 by 320 by um, by one. So this is our width, this is our height. So for our width side now, we have 213 minus our filter. Our filter is four by four filter. So minus four plus zero, since our padding is zero then divided by our stride, our using the first stride, which is one plus one. So this would just be um, 230 minus four, which is 209 plus one, which is 210. So that's what we have this here. Then if you apply the same thing here, so here is just, then you erase that two here. So if I clean this part now and see, okay. Okay, so, so we've got to now on this one. So now for the height now, which is 320, if you write it here, ah, 320. So 320 minus four is 316 plus one, 317. So, Okay, so that's why we have this as 317. So that will be the output of our. Uh, this will be the output of our convolution. And when we apply our convolution to it, this will be the output. So now we should then see that of the pulling layer now. Let me just shift this away. Our pulling layer size is um, 105 by 150. To confirm it now, I think we use two by two, so it would be, um, in this case, it's 210 minus two over two. So this is 208 divided by two. Then, and I think there's a plus one. Yeah, yeah plus one. So plus one, so this is going to give us um, 208 minus 2, which will give me 104 plus 1, 105. Then for the second part, which is 317, I'll just, oh, what can I do? 
Let me just go back. 317 minus 2 all over 2 plus 1 plus 1. So, okay, did this thing find? Let me see. 217 minus 2. Minus 2. Where am I? 158. So, yeah, it's, it performs this, what they call it, um, integer division. So, you run it down to 158. So, that's it. So, this is for our pulling layer. So, now we've seen that our pulling layer does not affect the depth, but it just uses the special dimension. So that's just it. So the next thing we're going to do now is to then go through how we can then do it. So we're going to use this patent data set to work on it. So now this, this we, I don't know if you know Sifaten, but Sifaten basically just predicts, is a data set that contains images with classes. 10 with 10 classes. So these are the 10 classes that present this for 10 data set. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to train a neural network from scratch that's ourselves using this and train using this data set. So this is what this for data set looks like. So this is just checking UTP is available. So the CP is available. Then um okay here this is just normal data loading itself speaking into train and test which we already know how to do. So, I don't know how long this will take. I'm mean, I didn't have this data set. Okay. But does this mean, okay, don't worry. Like, I'll just explain this and why it's downloading. So, let me just skip this part here. Let me just go straight to the main architecture. So, this is what the architecture looks like. If you have our input image here, let me enlarge this. So, if you have our input image here, you pass to our conventional layer. After taking it through our conventional layer, we apply our activation function, which we should know. We apply our activation function, but they didn't put it here. After applying our activation function, we pass it through our pulling layer. The pulling layer reduces dimension. So you can see the initial dimension, it reduces it to this. And after passing through our pulling layer, we apply a new convolutional layer, and then pass into pulling layer again. So we're just going to be using the pulling layer. We use the conventional layer to extract features and increase the, the depth. Then we use the pulling layer to reduce the dimension apply conventional layer again, reduce the dimension like that. So we have a very small amount of spatial dimension with enough information and depth about that image before we then pass it into our fully layer to do the normal neural network training. So yeah, so now I'm going to explain the, how it works. So I enable this thing like this. So now what happens is that we have the image. So in this case, the image is test two by test two by three. So that's what you pass into it. So when we apply this first conventional layer, like if, if you can see here, three means the input dimension, rather the input channel for depth. And this means how many the amount of depth you want to give out. Then this third three is then the filter size, in this case is three by three. And then padding of one, since you didn't specify stride, this is stride of one, two. So now, now that I'll put this thing here, so, Oh, let me let me open this notepad. So I'll just be doing the calculations together as we can name. So um here. Yeah. So now when we pass our image, the image initially is test two by test two by three. So after applying our conventional layer to it now, it should be thirty two. If you can see the, there's a pattern of one already. There's two. So okay, test two by minus three. Minus three um, plus our padding, which is two. So you, you know that it's two multiplied by the padding, which is one. Then divided by our stride. Our stride is one. Then plus this one here. So if you do this now, this will give you twenty nine plus two, which will give you um, thirty one plus one, give you thirty two. So you can see that this padding, unlike the other one where the padding was two. In order to get it, using a formula that I mentioned, to know the pattern to use, if I use the kernel size of, of filter size of three, so it is three minus one divided by two. This value, the, this operation will give us the size of padding to use in order to get exactly the same dimension we put. So your kernel or your filter minus one divided by two. 
it will give you exactly the same thing. So that's why using this padding here of one, and you perform this operation, you have test two by test to buy 16 this time around, because the new, it means we're applying 16 of these filters. We're applying 16 filters to this test two by test two by three. We apply 16 filters, then we now have 32 by 32 by 16. So another thing I've noticed from experience is that in most cases, aside your input channel, your your what do you call it, your next depth would be a multiple of um it will be increasing in powers of two. So from here 16, from 16, 32, from 32 to 64. If you had other ones from 64 to 120, from 120 to 256, from 256 to 512, from 512 to 124, and so on. So that's what I've noticed. So you could use other ones, but I know that in most cases, even if you check most of all these networks, between networks, that's what they mostly use. So now we've seen that a test two by test two will give us, this will give us test two by test two by 16, after we pass it through this here. So now, now we've done that. The next thing to then do is to then apply our activation function here, which is what we did. So if you notice, this part of just defining our, our functions here. So here's where the, the image is actually passing through the layers. So if the image passes through here, after this convolutional layer, it gets a test two by test two by 16, which we printed out here, test two by test two by 16. We apply activation function. Activation function does not have anything to do with it, so it's still test two by test two by 16. Then we then apply our pooling layer. So by default, the pooling layer is max pool. So Max will now be 32 by, oh, my is wrong. 32 by, multiply by minus, if you check it, let's look at it again. So our pooling layer one is two by two, that's two comma two. So it means that it is filter of two minus two, which is the stride plus one. So this is 30 divided by two plus one, 16. So that's why I raise the convolutional layer, the next convolutional layer will see 16 by 16 by 16. Remember, the initial one was test two by test two by 16. Then also note that your pooling layer does not, really, does not have anything to do with the depth. So the new one will be 16 by 16 by 16. So now we've done that one now. If you have 16 by 16, so we then apply a convolutional layer of this. So this thing is the same thing from with what we did here, only that the depth will, will increase from 16 to 32. But like we know that since we're passing the padding of one, and we're using this filter size of three. We're going to get exactly the initial dimension. So now it's going to be 16 by 16 by 32 after this convolutional 2D layer. So um, if you look at it here, after the convolutional 2D layer, after this conv 2 layer, we'll have 16 by 16 by 32. Then when we apply our pooling layer now, it should be 16 minus, um, let me check it again. So that's, Okay, still the pooling layer, like this is still pooling. So 16 minus two all over two. So this will give you seven. So if you check it here, or oh, is it, okay, sorry, plus one. So there's a plus one. So this will give you seven plus one. It's, so our new dimension is eight by eight by 32. So now if you pass it to another layer now, it's increase it from eight by eight by 32 to eight by eight by 64 because we are using this setting. So the pattern is going to make sure that we get exactly the same thing. Now we'll come back to this pulling layer again, because we apply the third pulling layer here. So now it should then be, in this case, let me use my eraser, choose eraser, size this, yeah. So if I use this eraser to, to clean this. So remember, we said it is eight. So it would be eight minus two, which is six divided by two. 6 divided by 2 is 3 plus 1, which is 4. So our new dimension would be, um, sorry, what am I doing? So after this, 8 by 8 by 8. So the output of this particular one would be 4 by 4 by 64. So the layer is 4 by 4 by 64. So now we've got something smaller. We can decide to even apply another one again. If you apply another one, let me see which one works. So if you add 4 by 4, Sorry, if I have four by four, four minus two will give you, um, will give you two all over two plus one. So this would be my, if I, if I apply another comb layer, let's just say, um, if I don't add it, that's, we'll say it. 
So let me just apply another one. Self dot self dot com four is equal to let me copy this. So this one will be from sixty four, like I said, to one hundred twenty eight. So now when you apply this, initially this model was seen was so seen four by four, four by four by. 64. Okay. So now when I apply this, it then be 4 minus 2 is um, 2. So our output to be 2 here. So we have a 2 by 2 after we pass it through this one here. So now our pin layer, we apply pin layer. So now it will be 128 by 2 by 2. So if you multiply this um, together, We have five one two. Hmm. It even looks like this one is even bigger than the other one, but okay. Well, let's just say it's five one two. Yeah, so yeah, it's five one two. So now, because we've changed this, we cannot use this one again. So it definitely has to be 128. When you flatten it, 128 by 2 by 2. Then, so these are linear layer 512. Then we can decide to take it to 500, but I don't know, whichever one. So you can take it from 512 to 500. But at this point, it will work because I've specified it. So now I have to add it here again. My, my network has to pass through that for two one. So it should be self dot pool, self dot call the fourth one that specified. Yeah. Then yeah, our linear layer receives this and then sends it to this. Okay. So here when we flatten our image, we are flattening um one twenty eight by two by two. Yeah. So this should work. So we so we specify an, an additional one here using the formula. I hope you get what I'm saying, what I'm doing at this point. The fact that I used um when you apply this convolutional side and this pattern of this, you, you get exactly four by four by one twenty eight. Then when we apply our print layer to the third one. When you apply a printing, I would then have two by two by one twenty eight based on what I've put already. So this should work. Then we have other things like our, you know, it's ten classes. So that's why it is from this to this, then from five hundred to ten because that's what we want. Then we're using dropout, the dropout probability of zero point two five. So this is here. After flattening it, we pass we add, apply the dropout. We pass it to our effect in layer. Apply dropout again and pass it into a second hidden layer. So this returns the logics for the 10 classes. So if I build my model now, so you can see it here. So this is like a model summary that we've applied. So the, the, the depth gets increasing up to here. So this should work. Sorry. So let me see if the data set has downloaded completely. Okay, yeah, we've got the data set. So visualizing it. So this is what the Sifatian data set looks like. Then this is I just this means this is just for visualizing the pigs used in each of in a single image. Or is it single image? Let's see. Let's see one. Yeah, so this are this this is showing all the pigs values in the image. So now for the architecture side, so this is my model here. So, yeah, this is my model here. I'll define my model. Then the normal thing, model the optimizer and all. Learn it was 0.01. These ones are the things that we already know. Then let's just trade and see how it's doing.
Okay, yeah. So if I'm very strange, it means that there was no error. So this this structure works. But if you if you make any mistake in any of these calculations, you should probably throw an error at that point when it's actually because it'll be miss a mismatch of dimensions. I'll give you an instance. For I'll give you an instance here. So let me just squeeze the train. Let me stop the train. So if I if I like miss the dimension of this max pooling, let's say I calculate it wrong here and use yeah, and I let's say I put it as this here. So it will definitely be an issue because there will be mismatched. Yeah, you can see it. So my is mismatched. You can see, so that's because I didn't use the right dimension. So this should train, then basically that's just how you build your neural network. That's how you build your CNN. So using those same calculations, so I will make sure that I share those, this um, notebook, this um, pages rather, these articles. So this one is by, I think, Stanford. So where they explain this, but this guy's one was more explanation because he really explained a lot to me when I, when I read it. So this one, this was the second part where he spoke about your pooling layers and your, what do you call it? And your activation function. So I think this, you should read this these two articles this one is the training okay so like that's it for conventional learning networks okay yeah i'll was, I was send everything i'll send everything so sorry do you have any questions at all but just to say you it's almost very certain that you can't compare the accuracy you get from a pre-trained network isn't transferred into that when videos from scratch because they are very way they are way way deeper. If you have any question, please you can say it. Anyway, let me just try and see that uh, original. Yeah. Sorry, I, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. So um, earlier on, you spoke about um, adding patterns to the kernels while performing. Uh, um, on the convolution layer, right? So, yes, is there any, um, does it uh, is there any advantage for me adding uh, paddings or not adding paddings? That is trying to keep the uh, the actual size of my image constant. Yes, yes. Look, I I, I spoke about it, but let me just say it again. So, the thing about that padding now, why it's important is that you know when you apply your convolutional layer, if you look at, let me show you here, when you apply a convolutional layer. Um, here, so okay. No, there's this image that I used that was quite explanatory. Yeah, so if you look at this now, the initial size was seven by seven. And if you apply a convolutional layer, just a single um, filter, if you apply a filter to go through this image, you have five by five. So if you imagine this image was seven by seven by three, and this image was five by five, like it definitely has to be five by five by three. So your filter was your filter dimension must be the same as your input dimension. So if it's seven by seven by three, it should be five by five by three. So when you apply a five by five by three filter to the seven by seven by three. Oh, what am I saying? So if the filter is three by three. Like this is a three by three filter. Your filter has to be three by three by three because your image size is seven by seven by seven. So when you apply it to it, you have a new dimension which should be five by five by one. Because you apply just a single filter. So you have five by five by one. Combining a filter with the image will give you a new image with a new dimension with channel one or depth one. So now if I apply this filter to this image size four times, I will have five by five by four. If you apply it 16 times, you have five by five by 15. So now the thing is that just applying a single filter once already reduces it to five by five by one if i apply that filter five times yeah, i'm going to reduce it to something else so it means it to be five by five by one then i'll apply another one again it will keep reducing so the point is that we do not want this um conventional side to we do okay sorry i'll come back to i'll come back to that question so let me just finish with this so we do not want the 
um, the you just want you just want this convolutional layer to help us get features. When I mean get features, we want to keep increasing the depth. So if you check that one we built here, this guy here, and um, loss is decreasing, so it makes sense. So if you check this guy out now, uh, after a conditional layer, the, it, the depth increased from 3 to 16. So increasing depth from 3 to 16 means that you've gained features. Applying a filter multiple times makes it get features very well. So we just want our conditional layer to just gain those features, not reduce. Because when it keeps reducing, imagine you want to apply 16 filters now. It means that if the image size was tested by 32, it should just keep reducing for every time we apply that filter. But we do not want the size to reduce. That's why we normally add those padding so it doesn't reduce. So we only want our pulling layer to be the one to reduce it. Because our pulling layer does not have anything to do with the um, depth. It's just going to reduce the dimension. So we want to have a way of making sure that our image size reduces when we actually want it to reduce. Do you get Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I get you now. Okay, okay. Okay, how do you know how to get the dimension with you there? So, you can use any, okay, look at um, one instance, one instance where I had to change the, okay. I'll just open this one here. I'll just open this one, but like this is meant to be our assignment, but where we try and implement what's called batch normalization. But let me just talk about the structure a bit. Because this one I implemented using personalization. So in this place here, um, okay, not here, not here. I'll use the I didn't. I'll use another example. So yeah, so look at it now. Let's talk about. Let's use this one as an example now. So remember now, if you check what we had here, if you check this one now, the last one was one twenty eight by two by two. So it was two by two image size by one twenty eight. So we can decide to still reduce this one, even though I just stopped here. You can decide to reduce it again to one by one by two sixty six. So now what you do now is that for you to get it, the image size was two in this case. Now I'm going to change the filter size for my pulling layer now. So two minus two divided by two plus one. What does this give us? This will give us one. Okay, this one, this one, this is not like the best way to explain this thing because let me see. Two minus two is, is, is zero plus one, one. So this will be our new dimension if we applied. So this one still works. So I won't use this guy. Let me try and use this one to explain this. So now we want to determine our filter size. So here we can use different types of filter size. Like any filter works. But the main thing is that what you want to change are your stride and um okay, I think it's just stride because stride just makes you know how many how you want to move. But your filter size, you almost don't need to change your filter size. You can use any filter size you want. The main thing is that if you're using any filter size, just make sure that every other part supports it, which is your stride. So if I'm using three now, I can decide to use a filter size of two. If I use a filter size of two, it means that the output will change, but it does not really have anything to affect it. Let me, let me see. So if I use a filter size of two, so if I have like seven, seven minus two plus zero all over one plus one. So this is five plus one, six. So a filter of two, we just make it six by six. Yeah. So like it doesn't really matter actually in the real sense. But because if if you have any filter, you try to use any filter because that's the first thing you select. If you use any filter, you just have to make sure that every other condition is followed with that particular filter you're using. So if I use filter of this, I can try to use a stride of two. So if it's a two by two, so it'll be one, two, three. Yeah. So if I use it will be to be three, two, so let me put it so why is this stride of two? This will be seven minus two, five. Five divided by two. Even though this will really work out well, but to give you a, give you a decimal value. 
But I think PyTorch summarizes it, when PyTorch brings it down, but basically this won't work because if you have seven by seven and you have a filter of two, so this is the size of your filter here, and you're moving two by two. So this is the size of filter, then this one, two, it comes here, then one, two, it comes here. Yeah, then this is the last part that is left over, this half, if you use a filter of two. So you have to use something that work. But if you use a stride of three, let's try a stride of three. This is two, then one, two, three, two, then one, two, three. Wait, sorry. Three. Um, so if I just try with three, yeah, it still it still won't work. Okay. But but any stride work, any um filter works, any side of filter works. Because that's really not the issue. That's the first thing you make. That's the first thing you do when you're making any selection process. I don't know if you got what I said. Okay. 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 So, like, do you have any other question at all? Okay, so um, what we've done so far is how to um, how to train the network using um, our own CNN, so using our own custom CNN. So I'll share this notebook so we can go through it and then try many other values you want. You can try to use a higher padding if you want, but we'll just make sure that your next input is getting exactly the output you have when you apply the padding. So you can try many other things you want. You can decide to use padding of four. You can decide to do other things you want. You can try out different sizes. So then, but there's one more thing that I then want to talk about, so which is batch normalization. So I want us to apply batch normalization using PyTorch on this particular notebook. So one thing about batch normalization is that it definitely increases your accuracy. So you just compare the accuracy you get after using this with when you also use batch normalization. So Batchization will definitely increase your score because it makes it balanced and it helps reduce this vanishing gradient descent problem. So I want us to just check PyTorch documentation on how to make use of batch norm. So you just apply batch norm to this already um, this already existing architecture. Let me just try searching for it. Um, PyTorch batch normalization. So like there's a function, it's really not anything difficult. So you just apply it to, um, let me see, come on here. Um, let me go with you to an example of it. And here, yeah, so I think we've already started it. Yeah, so this is here. So this patch norm 1D is for one dimension, which is your linear layer. So the one you use for your convolutional layer is 2D. So you use this one here for your batch norm. So that's just it. So I want us to just try out that batch norm on that same example, which is this one that is currently running here. We we'll just add batch norm and then compare the accuracy you get with it. So that's it. Do you have any questions at all, or any concerns, or anything? It's not not just relating to this, or any other thing. Drum rolls. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you very I'll... much. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think um, you, you might get questions when uh, we go through the uh, notes notebooks and the yeah. articles. Okay, okay, you can message me on Slack too. So. Yeah, because right now it seems a whole lot to digest for now. <laughs> okay, the notebook is there. I'll send all the materials. They're quite explanatory, so you have any difficulties. Stanley. Yeah. 
Can you please make sure all these materials are on GitHub? I don't think there is a repository created. Can you do that? Can you create okay. uh, yes, yes, yes. and put okay, all the okay. materials there instead? Okay, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. So let's see the output to what this thing is doing actually. Oh, this is slow. Okay, that's the last one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to spend so soon. I'm going to start to do that. Thing. You want to go back to CPU, right? Yeah, like there's this move. Just to to in brackets, then put CPU. Uh, right. In brackets. Uh, I think. Okay, let me try that one. There's this. Let me see. No, like, like are you are you trying to convert to CUDA or CPU? To I think to CPU. Oh, so I want to put CUDA again. Wait. Um, tensor dot. I think it's tensor dot CP. Dot CP. Can't convert to that tensor to NumPy. I think it's. I'm not sure. I've come across something like this. Let me see. Uh, and yeah, this is something like this. Then the output put CPU. Guys, can you see how you win in the competition? Copy and <laughs> <laughs> and there's no crime in copy. Why okay. well, maybe we show whether it's this one? No, it's not here. You're putting it. You're putting it down. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll try it. I'll just test it here too. Whoa. Mm. Ah. Oh. Wow. Wait, let me see where this is coming from. Can't go back to that tensor to NumPy. But that's where we go back. You're not, are you sure like you are that. reading this thing? You are not reading it too. And I, like I doubt I'm doing. I'm just trying to print out. So, um, I, I don't think images. Um, even though you you need to make image equals to images dot CPU because what you oh, have. Right yeah. Now, Sorry, I don't know why I did this. Um, Let's see if we are back to. I'm coming. So I don't think the ag max and everything is needed or something. Uh, I think it's just this first one. Mm. Yeah, or you put it mm. up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I love it. You see, read. Read before you <laughs> can. <laughs> yeah, I have to like read it first before. <laughs> okay, thanks. So that's it. So it could get better. Anyway, if you apply that virtualization, it will increase accuracy. Not like very well, but it will at least make it better. So, thanks. Well, you didn't get the materials today, right? 
Yes, yes. I'll send this. I'll just try and put them together now and send them. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. All right, bye everyone. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks. Enjoy. Yeah. Keep your physical distance. Stay safe. Eh? Keep your physical okay. distance if you can. Oh yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right.